This is the BBC. Hello and welcome to the podcast of The Life Scientific, first broadcast on BBC Radio 4. I'm Jim Al-Khalili and my mission is to interview the most fascinating and important scientists alive today and to find out what makes them tick. My guest today has saved more lives than most doctors would ever hope to. Yet, most aren't actually his patients. In fact, we're all his patients in some respect. And there are simply too many of us eating our way into early graves. The food we eat is now the greatest cause of death and illness worldwide. And the main culprits, salt, sugar and fat, are so embedded in our diet that half the time we don't even know they're there like the low-fat flavoured yoghurts brimming with sugar, or a serving of one brand of hot chocolate that contains more salt than a bag of crisps. It takes a keen eye and dogged determination to keep track of what we eat and cut down. But luckily for us, it's an attribute that Graham McGregor has in spades. As Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Wolfson Institute of Preventative Medicine, he campaigns tirelessly to persuade the food industry to reduce these demons in our diet. Firstly, salt and now sugar. Trust me, over the next half hour, plenty of myths and widely held misconceptions will be busted. Graham McGregor, welcome to The Life Scientific. Thank you. Now, if I think back to my childhood, Graham, in the 60s and 70s, there was far less processed food about, but it was starting to take hold. So how did it all go so wrong? Well, there's no doubt most of the food we eat now is processed. We have little time to cook ourselves. I mean, some people have that privilege, but most people are rushing around, want to put something instantly in a microwave and have a meal in five minutes. And unfortunately, all those foods in general are very unhealthy. They don't need to be, but they are full of salt, fat and sugar, as you pointed out. So what's the best way to deal with this problem? Is it up to each of us individually? No, definitely not. The food industry is stuffing this stuff in and they then say, oh, but you, you don't have to buy it. But they then spend billions of pounds marketing in very surreptitious ways, often to children. And, of course, people buy it. And it's very difficult. There is no choice in reality. If you want an instant meal, you can't buy a healthy one. And we're told that salt and sugar add flavour. So don't people notice when they're reduced? Well, the beautiful thing about it is that as you reduce your salt, and for that matter sugar as well, your salt taste or sugar taste receptors adjust. So you then get much more sensitive, i.e. they trigger at lower concentrations of salt or sugar. And this has been shown in the UK where salt intake has fallen and people don't even notice that the foods have got 30-40% less salt Mm. in. And I guess it makes sense even with sugar. I used to take sugar in my coffee. Now I couldn't contemplate having no, it's uh, very sweet coffee. That's yeah. 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 Your interest in what we all eat started with salt. In the late 70s, you were doing research as a kidney specialist at Charing Cross Hospital in London. What got you interested in salt? Well, we were interested in a particular hormone system that was coming from the kidney and that's only activated on a very low salt intake when you're getting deprived of salt in the body. So to look at the system, we were putting people on a very low salt diet. So we all need to have some salt, but what's it there for? We only need tiny amounts to maintain the fluid in our blood volume and in the fluid that bathes the tissues. And if we don't have enough salt, you get a reduction in that volume and you can get seriously ill. But it's tiny amounts. No mammal eats salt. We're all designed to live away from the sea and hold on to that salt. Now we're eating vast amounts of salt compared to what we actually need. How much is necessary? You need about half a gram a day, and on average we're eating about 10 grams a day, 20 times the amount that we actually need. How do we know that we only need half a gram? Well, we know from studying Yamamamo Indians, particularly in the Venezuelan jungle, who still lead a hunter-gatherer life, they're eating even less than half a gram of salt a day, and yet they're living in a very hot environment. They're exercising, you know, run 20, 30 miles a day, chasing animals, trying to get some meat if they can, and they're very fit, they sweat a lot, and yet they're eating very little salt. So we we don't need it. So what's the recommended amount that we should be aiming for at the moment? Well, because we're eating so much, we thought we could get down to six grams, but the ideal is probably around three grams. So why not aim for just half a gram a day? Well, you've got to be practical, you see. I mean, remember, the food industry 
is the biggest industry in the world, the most profitable industry, and in the UK, one of the biggest payers of tax and one of the biggest exporters. So you've got to come to a compromise where they make the food more healthy and still make a profit. It's a bit yeah, like aiming yeah. for five fruit and veg a day. It's almost an arbitrary amount. That's right, because actually we know eating more fruit and vegetable a day is more it's beneficial. Even better. Yeah, but yeah. it's a target that we aspire to, you know. OK, so why does the food industry put all that salt in our food? What purpose does it serve? Well, there are several commercial reasons. One is obviously the taste, and you take something like a cheap hamburger, which has no flavour whatsoever. You bring it up to the concentration of almost seawater, and it then becomes edible. That, of course, then means that if children and adults eat that regularly, their salt taste receptors become suppressed. They then prefer foods with a very high salt concentration, and when mum cook some a nice meal at home with no salt oh it doesn't taste like the the hamburger the other is that when you add salt with polyphosphates to meat or fish products you can bind in extra water and you can increase the weight by about 20 percent because it forms a gel and you'll see this in bacon when you fry it now the first thing that happens is all this water comes out which they've stuffed in there and you paid for that water the other thing is that salt makes you thirsty and very important for soft drink manufacturers, beer manufacturers and the water industry. Let's pursue the science of this. You said salt makes you thirsty. How exactly does salt cause problems? Well, when you eat more salt, the amount of salt in the blood goes up. Salt is sodium and chloride, two ions together. That affects the brain receptors that tell you you must drink more water because we're trying to keep the blood system at an equilibrium. So immediately you get this feeling of thirst. And it's not related to the taste of salt on my palate? No, no, it's related to the amount of sodium and chloride in the blood. As soon as that goes up, you get thirsty and it becomes a desperate need after a while. You'll drink the lavatory water, you'll drink muddy water, anything. When you're thirsty, you go mad, you know, because you've just got to have it. And you did studies in the 70s that demonstrated this connection. Yeah, we were doing what are called balanced studies where we could feed people. We knew exactly how much salt they were eating. And you can then look very carefully at what's happening to the amount of fluid inside them. What did you find then? What we showed was that when you went from a low to a higher salt intake, you gained weight and that weight gain was actually retaining fluid inside you. So these patients were holding on to more fluid the more salt that they ate? Absolutely. You're sloshing around with one or two litre bottles of water inside you. Now of course water's supposed to be good for you, it keeps you hydrated. Well, it's a bit of a myth from the hydration industry, you know, the people who make all the mineral waters. They've managed <laughs> to establish this. There's no harm in drinking the excess water. All it does is make you urinate more. But the idea that it's immensely beneficial is rubbish. You said salt makes you thirsty. So how does this excess water then start to affect our health? Well, it's a bit like a central heating system with a pump. If you put more fluid in, the pressure goes up. It's a very slow process over many years, and we used to think, you know, I remember when I was a student, we were taught that blood pressure goes up with age. That's normal. It's not normal. If you look at these people living in the Venezuelan jungle, they don't have any rise in blood pressure with age. So it's highly abnormal to see this rise in pressure, and it's almost entirely due to the very large amount of salt that we eat. So it's not inevitable. No, you're no, saying that blood no. pressure will go up as no, you no, age. No, If you look at the population with high blood pressure, at 20, 20% 20 have high blood pressure, at 40, 40%, at 60, 60%, and at 80, 80% of individuals will have high blood pressure. That's incredible. If I reduce my salt intake, say down to the level of those Yanomami Indians... I could potentially rule out getting high blood pressure as I get older. If you started early in life, yes. OK, why is having this high blood pressure, if you're carrying too much liquid in your body, dangerous? First of all, blood pressure is the biggest killer in the world and it kills you through strokes, heart attacks and heart failure. Now, those are partly due to the pressure effects. You can understand a stroke is when you either bleed into the brain and that's the pressure of the blood bursting a vessel or damaging small vessels. Heart failure may be due to the pressure as well because if the pump 
which is pumping the bladder and has to work at a much higher pressure, that puts it under strain and particularly have damage to the heart muscle. The other mechanism is it accelerates the furring of arteries. You know we're depositing cholesterol in all our arteries and that is accelerated by blood pressure and also smoking. And you actually get a clot in the artery and that's what causes a heart attack or a very big cause of stroke. Interesting stuff. Well, back in the late 70s, Graham McGregor, the link between salt and blood pressure wasn't well established, but you ran one of the first studies to explore the relationship between them. What got you interested? I went to a big international meeting on high blood pressure, and I was incredibly surprised at a very distinguished Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford who was debating the fact that salt was nothing to do with blood pressure. And I couldn't understand this. He was poo-hooing all the studies and so on. And I came back and said, right, we'll do a properly controlled study of modest salt restriction because the previous studies have been very severe salt reduction. We were able to do it double blind so we get the individuals to restrict their salt intake then in a randomised trial we either give them back sodium tablets to bring their salt intake back to normal or placebo. So first of all all the participants are on a reduced That's salt correct, intake. Yeah. So you, you're starting from a level Absolutely, playing field yeah. as it were. Yeah. And then you've got them in two groups. And crucially we say they were blinded. Those participants that were taking the salt tablets they didn't know because you'd coated them. Absolutely right. They were wax encapsulated tablets of salt so that when you swallowed it you didn't realise it had got salt in it. And of course the people measuring the blood pressure too didn't know which they were on. Why was this important? Well because in the past they'd always changed the diet. Now you know when you're on a low salt diet, if you think it benefits you or the person measuring your blood pressure knows, it can contaminate the study. So this was the first study that really showed clearly that modest salt reduction, cutting it by half, had a big effect on lowering blood pressure. So we did a variety of different studies looking at it. So if you've already got high blood pressure, maybe you're on medication, maybe you're not, will reducing your salt intake help at all? Oh yes, absolutely. Very effective. It's as effective as a single drug therapy if you really cut it by half. The difficulty is doing that in the face of the modern world. Everywhere you move is all this rubbish processed food. Another myth, I gather, is this idea that we have to replace the salt we lose through sweating when we exercise. Again, it's rubbish. Because we're mammals, living away from the sea, no mammal eats salt, all our mechanisms are designed to hold on salt. So as soon as you reduce your salt intake, the amount of salt in the sweat reduces to zero. And that's the same for the urine. But back in the 70s and 80s, this wasn't... No, I mean, even at school, I remember we were given salt tablets when it got hot, which is absolutely ridiculous. And it was interesting at the time because the tablets we were using in these studies were actually given, as I understand it, to the British football team in Mexico. So it was thought it might help them, but it didn't, unfortunately, and I think they lost because rather they badly. Were carrying too, carrying much, too fluid. much fluid around. <laughs> Sloshing absolutely. around inside them. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back to your first study, Graham, when you looked at the relationship between salt intake and blood pressure, how was it received? There was quite a lot of opposition. I was surprised, really. I was pretty naive at that stage about the food industry and the commercial value of salt, and I couldn't quite see why they wanted to keep these very high salt levels in food. And, of course, the salt manufacturers were also carrying out big public relations exercises at the time trying to say that what we were saying was absolute rubbish which it wasn't pretty Mm. unpleasant trying to get at you what impact did this have on you personally well we tried to do a lot but actually at the time i was being paid by the wellcome trust which was a academic research body and i was not able to speak out so much because one of the people who referees my application was a senior professor of medicine who was a blood pressure expert who i discovered was being paid by the salt public relations people to go around saying that salt didn't put up blood pressure and so on, which surprised me somewhat. But it did make it a bit difficult for me because I was being paid by an organisation, not that they had anything to do with Mm. that, who I knew this guy was going to go back to them if I got got too extreme. And they'd cut your funding. That's what I was worried about. How did that make you feel? Well, it was a challenge. (laughs) Um, It probably had the opposite effect of what the food industry wanted. I think it made me very determined to do something about it when I was in the right position to do something Mm. about it. I gather you also took personal steps to cut down on your own salt intake. 
Yeah, well, obviously, having seen this, I decided <laughs> that perhaps eating salt wasn't a very good idea and stopped eating salt more or less entirely at home. And it tastes a lot better once you've got used to it. Mm. We also wrote a book about how to stick to a low-salt diet to try and encourage people to do it. That was essentially a recipe book, I gather. Yeah. Give me a, something I could try out in the kitchen. Secret is very easy. You just use your favourite recipe. We don't have any salt <laughs> or no soy sauce or stock cubes. Cooking without salt is not difficult. You know, my worry even now is we go out to a restaurant, if there's a, a chef that puts too much salt in, I can't eat the food. How was your book received then? It wasn't like the diet books now. <laughs> I think I made a few hundred pounds. I was accused by the salt public relations people in the United States of being pro-salt because of all the profits I've made from the book. I wish I had, but I didn't. (laughs) It became apparent later on that it's not very practical for people to really reduce their salt intake because of the environment we live in. Well, it's around this time, at the end of the 1980s, Graham, that you moved to St George's Hospital Medical School as Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine, where you became more outspoken on the issue of salt in the nation's diet. Why was that? Well, I was free because I was being paid independently by the university, so I was free of any compunction to feel that I had to Mm. keep my mouth shut. So it emboldened you then to speak up more loudly? I think that's correct, yeah, definitely. You know, if you feel people are attacking you, you either give up or you say, right, I'm really going to show them that I'm right. So what did you do? There were a group of us on an expert panel looking at diet and cardiovascular disease, and we came up with all the usual recommendations. But one of them was to reduce salt intake and to get the food industry to start taking it out. Now, that was endorsed by the Conservative government at the time, But then there was a campaign in the media about nanny state and people could choose their own, which was complete rubbish. And then eventually it all came out in the British Medical Journal that the Prime Minister, who was John Major, was being threatened with withdrawing funds from the food industry because of this. Funds to the party. Party, yeah, for the election, presumably. And he apparently ordered the Department of Health to rescind the SALT recommendations. Now, this was very odd because these recommendations are put in a library and gather dust. You know, nothing ever happens to all these things. And we didn't expect anything to happen. But this galvanised us because it was all in the British Medical Journal, all the leaked correspondence. And we set up this action group to do something about SALT and reverse that decision. So, I mean... I often thought I should thank John Major for what he did, Hmm. uh, because without him, nothing would have ever happened. So suddenly there you were in 1996, running a public health campaign group, Consensus Action on Salt and Health, or CASH. What were those initial few weeks like? I hadn't really sort of thought through what we were doing. (laughs) It was pretty chaotic. And we knew we needed to get the politicians involved in the food industry, and you have to do that through the media. We were aware of that. But how did we get the media involved? But gradually I learned with the help of others, and we got very expert and had a big campaign about the fact that we needed to reduce salt in the UK and reasons why and, and so on. And we convinced within, I think, about three years... I think three of the major supermarkets to start reducing the salt in their products before the government had changed its mind. And I gather for you personally, you had some inspiration for your campaigning skills, a family connection. Well, my father had been professor of dental surgery. He was very much involved in fluoridation of the water supply in the 50s to try and stop tooth decay, particularly in children. It's a slightly different area, although ironically with sugar, we're coming back to tooth decay. And he died very young, didn't he, of a heart attack? He died of a heart attack, which I think may have influenced me to some extent, you know, the Mm. fact that I thought it's wrong that people should die at that age and of course he did all the wrong things I can see that very clearly now but we didn't know at that time they were the wrong things. Mm. Well five years after setting up your salt action group the Labour government under Blair eventually endorsed the salt recommendations Mm. that the previous government Mm. had rejected. How did you get them to commit? Well, we were very lucky with the public health minister at the time, Tessa Jowell, who decided she was going to do something about it and got the Food Standards Agency to take it on. And fortunately, Sir John Krebs was the first chair, a very good scientist, and he was very keen to do the salt work. So we worked together and devised a plan. And the whole point of this was to get the food industry to take the salt out of the food 
not get consumers to change, and that particularly affects the socially deprived, because they eat the cheapest products, which have the most salt in. So what was your strategy then, to get the food industry to change? We had a lot of debate about this at the time, but we set targets for each food group, 86 categories of food. Let's take bread, because that's the biggest source of salt in the diet. But we don't think of bread as being very high in salt content. Well, it is the same concentration as crisps, but... It's mixed in, it's not on the outside. So it doesn't taste very salty. Bread without salt cuts your salt intake by about a third straight away. All the bread had to be below such a level. We discussed it with the bread industry. They would agree after a lot of pressure. It was a voluntary policy. And then after two years, you'd meet again and set the target further ahead, slightly more difficult. So after you've done it three times, which we have done now in the UK, you've got now these 30 to 40% reductions in the amount of salt in these foods without anyone realising it. So that's a major Mm. achievement. This, of course, was a voluntary scheme. Mm. So how did you motivate the food industry to sign up in the first place? Pretty strong-arm tactics that we were going to name and shame them. We are renowned for doing that. We do surveys of which are the worst breads, which are the worst cereals, and the manufacturer of that particular product is going to be worried they're going to get highlighted. Also being strong-armed, if you have a minister who says, look, if, you're not, if you don't do it, I'm going to legislate, that helps. And countries all over the world have copied the UK plan and many of them are now regulating the sort targets. So, for instance, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina and Chile, they actually have regulated sort targets. So you don't need to have all the mm. media. And with your voluntary scheme, what impact did that then have? We were lucky in that the Food Standards Only set up a good monitoring of it so that we were able to measure salt intake and random samples of the population. We also had random sampling of blood pressure. We actually published that a couple of years ago, showing there'd been a fall in salt intake of around 15%, 1.4 grams per person per day, yeah, from 9.5 to 8.1, and also a fall in population blood pressure of just over 3 millimetres of mercury. Now that may sound tiny to you, but on a population basis, that's huge. That will prevent more strokes and heart disease than all of the treatment we currently give for high blood pressure. What sort of saving did this make on the NHS? But it had saved the health service £1.5 billion per year. So for £1 spent, you save £300, which is the most cost-effective public health programme we know. I mean, that's now recognised by the World Health Organisation. And we had a lot of difficulty persuading the WHO initially about the benefits of salt, but they're now one of our major players worldwide in pushing for salt reduction because it's so cost-effective. Despite this huge success in reducing the nation's salt intake, I gather the food industry has since slowed down in its efforts. Well, unfortunately, you have to deal with the politics, and we had a uh, coalition, but effectively conservative government came in in 2010, and a minister of health who made what he called a responsibility, where he made the industry responsible for policing themselves, when I used to tell him it was a complete waste of time, and it was, it's been closed now, and the responsibility for salt has gone back to Public Health England, so hopefully we'll see a better plan coming out. We do have targets to hit, and the food industry is working towards them, but there's no real pressure on them. It's a tragedy because many thousands of people have died unnecessarily as a result of this decision by this minister, and we published that. Well, Graham, despite the ongoing challenge uh, with salt, in January 2014, you took on another demon in our diet, sugar. I mean, what the hell possesses you? (laughs) Well, I thought I was a bit mad at the time. Uh, But we tried to get other NGOs in the UK to do it. They weren't interested, for reasons I don't understand. They are now. And so, in the end, we decided to do it ourselves because we knew exactly what to do. Huge publicity, pressure on politicians, pressure on the food industry, and then get action, you know. And this is action on sugar? That's right, yeah. Uh, Initially, we had the Minister of Health uh, involved, and he wanted a plan. Then we got so much publicity that David Cameron took it over, and we were talking to Downing Street Office Policy Unit, and we had quite a good plan 
for preventing obesity, which involves sugar but also fat reduction and advertising restrictions and various other attacks on sweet and sugar drinks. It gradually got eroded by the food industry over a period of time. And then just when David Cameron was going to announce it, he resigned because of the EU referendum. And then Theresa May published it without any publicity a few weeks later, having cut the report down from, I think, 36 pages to 10 and removed a lot of actions. But we're still left with some positive actions. So what is it that we're left with? We're left with reformulation, 20% reduction in sugar in products that contribute most to children's sugar intake by 2020. So we just set targets with Public Health England for the food industry, exactly the same way as we did for salt. There's a tax on sugar-sweetened drinks with the option to reformulate below the tax threshold. A lot of companies are doing that, which is good, but of course Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola haven't, and they're our main target. But fortunately, sugar-sweetened drink sales are falling quite rapidly with all the publicity. Do you think this is enough? Do we need? Do you need to be tougher? Oh, absolutely. Look, this is a start. Now, what we want to do is work on Theresa May to get her to focus. But, of course, her main focus is on Brexit and all that at the moment, so it's a difficult time. But we're focusing on what Public Health England is doing and fully supporting them to make sure this is successful. And in the meantime, what can listeners do to help themselves? You can help by going to their supermarket and complaining but looking at labels, we have a food switch app you can download which can tell you in signpost labelling exactly what's in all the foods. It will compare other products with less sugar, less salt, less fat. I think generally making more noise from consumers is very helpful, particularly to supermarkets and branded companies, writing to them, complaining to them. But again, our aim is to look after the socially deprived because they're the ones who die 15 years before people like ourselves and I think our whole aim has been to give that choice in terms of reducing the huge amounts of salt fat and sugar in the very cheap products without them realizing it. It does puzzle me though I mean we talked about the reduction in salt saving the NHS 1.5 billion pounds a year it seems to make utter economic sense that a government would want to enact some of these policies. Well, I agree, but the the problem is faced by the reality of the food industry. You have to realise they're incredibly powerful. They have direct access to Downing Street, and particularly with the Brexit and all the worries there. You know, you can see how the food industry goes along and says, well, but if we have to do this, we might lose exports, this, that and the other. I mean, it's rubbish in my view. We have a very entrepreneurial food industry in the UK, and I'd praise them for what they've done with salt. And we've led the world in salt reduction. We're going to lead the world in sugar reduction. I just wish they'd be a bit more entrepreneurial. They're like ostriches. They put their head in the sand, you know. (laughs) So how do you stay positive? Well, we've seen it all before, I suppose. But you've got to be persistent, you've got to be bloody-minded, and you've got to be charming, and that's when you get action. You sound optimistic, then. Uh, Whether I'll still be around, another matter. But, (laughs) I mean, I'm I'm optimistic that in 10 years' time we'll have a coherent obesity plan for the UK, and we will have reduced salt intake even more than we are now. But it's going to need a lot of push and fight and I think we will be successful. You know, this is not like you're trying to force the food industry out of business. You know, like, for example, the tobacco industry. There'll always be a market to provide yeah, food. That's correct. And, of course, it makes sense to them because if they make more healthy food, we'll all live longer, they'll have more consumers, and a, a direct consequence of what they do is they kill people and dead consumers don't eat food. Graham McGregor, thank you very much for sharing your Life Scientific. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast of The Life Scientific. For more information or to listen to other episodes, please search for The Life Scientific on the Radio 4 website.